It was four in the morning on August 23rd, 1987, when the crew aboard a 75-car, 6,000-ton Union Pacific freight train more than a mile long, traveling at a rate of more than 50 miles per hour, en route to Little Rock, Arkansas, spotted two boys lying motionless across the tracks. This was no locomotive accident. Now, the members of this locomotive stated the bodies were partly covered by a green tarp now, this is where things start to get weird. From the beginning, cover-ups are rampant. It starts here, with the police claiming there was never any tarp. And that despite hearing a loud train and the locomotive blowing its horn, the boys just laid motionless on the tracks as if they didn't hear anything. The boys left home at midnight that night to go hunting, and they were going to use a technique known as spotlighting which involves using a bright light to scan for animals whose eyes brightly reflect the light after dark. The state medical examiner at the time, Dr. Fahmy Malik, ruled the deaths as an accident as a result of marijuana intoxication. I kid you not. The medical examiner said the boys had smoked the equivalent of 20 marijuana cigarettes and fell asleep on the tracks. The parents, of course, did not accept these findings, conducting their own investigation. March 1988, Dr. James Gary of San Antonio, completely out of state, medical examiner, offered a second opinion. He had already been skeptical about the findings of the marijuana. A second autopsy was done. When this examination showed that Don Henry's shirt contained evidence of a stab wound to the back and Kevin Ives' skull may have been crushed by his own rifle, the ruling was changed to definite homicide. Don Henry's own father also noted that he did not believe his son would risk getting his gun scratched by laying it on the gravel. He took too much pride in it. Now, Kevin Ives' mother believed, and this is the ongoing theory, that the boys had stumbled across a drug trafficking operation taking place. Specifically, that they came across a drug drop from an airplane similar to Barry Seal's operations near Mena. There's a drug. He just made the drop. Now, who is Barry Seal? Barry Seal was an American commercial airline pilot, a major drug smuggler, and when Seal was convicted of smuggling charges, he became an informant for the DEA and testified in several major drug trials. He was murdered on February 19th, 1986 by contract killers hired by, quote unquote, the cartel. In 1964, Seal joined TWA as a flight engineer and was soon promoted to first officer, then captain, flying a Boeing 707. He was the youngest 707 command pilots, one of the youngest, in the TWA fleet. His career, however, ended in July 1972 when he was arrested for involvement in, get this, a conspiracy to smuggle a shipment of plastic explosives to Mexico using a DC-4, which is a small airliner transport aircraft. SEAL started by smuggling small amounts of marijuana by air in early 1976. By 1978, he had expanded to flying significant loads of cocaine, pound for pound, a much more profitable enterprise than marijuana smuggling. In 1981, SEAL began smuggling cocaine for the Medellin cartel. At his peak, he earned as much as $500,000 per flight transporting shipments of cocaine from Colombia to the United States. You can refuel in, in uh, Nicaragua. And then you fly all the way, and Barry couldn't believe it. He says, all right, but I wanted to land. I had a place in Louisiana for $10,000 that I could land, unload, and the sheriff and all of them was paid off. And uh, he said, no, no, no. I can't get caught in Mena, Arkansas. I said, what do you mean you can't get caught in Mena, Arkansas? You get caught anywhere. He said, I can't. If it gonna, but it's going to cost you $50,000 every time my wheels touch the ground. Why can you explain why he can't get he caught? He said he was he was hooked up with the with him the very top, and he even said I'm going to have dinner with the governor tonight. That's at that so time. Mena, Arkansas, Mr. Bill Clinton, undoubtedly. The ambulance driver that arrived at the scene that that morning said that she talked to three men who claimed they were volunteer firefighters from a neighboring city that wanted to see what was going on near the site of the accident. And finally, Dr. Malik began to face some serious scrutiny. Scrutiny by the media, the community, pretty much everybody. 
Everybody, that is, except for Bill Clinton. The months preceding the boys' deaths, anybody that had any information relating to this case whatsoever, they all started dying in weird accidents or straight up assassinations. Keith McCastle stabbed to death in his driveway 113 times. Gregory Collins was shot in the face, and you guessed it, it was ruled a suicide. Keith Coney, who was with Don and Kevin right before the murders and just escaped himself, had his throat cut just days after this incident. Jordan Kettleson, who was believed to be connected to the McCastle murder, killed by shotgun blast to the head. No police investigation. Mike Samples, grand jury witness, shot to death. Jeff Rhodes was murdered after telling his family he knew too much about Kevin and Don. He was shot in the head and his remains set on fire in a dump. Now considering the difficulty the grand jury had keeping witnesses alive, it really isn't any wonder why this case remains unsolved. Charlene Wilson, a criminal involved in the drug drop, with a guilty conscience, also stated who was there that night and, well, roll the tape. The people at the track that night, to my knowledge, were Dan Harmon, Keith McCaskill, Larry Rochelle, I do know that the boys were watching the drop site, okay? And they got curious as to what was being dropped there. Now, even with all the public outrage and all the scrutiny, instead of firing Dr. Malik, Bill Clinton gave him a $14,000 raise and promoted him to chief medical examiner of the state. Jean Duffy tells how the FBI had eyewitnesses to the slayings. She tells us in a matter of fact tone. One witness at the scene even passed a polygraph, but still to this day, nothing has been done. Fahmy Malik was bulletproof in Arkansas. He was completely protected, states Duffy. Jean Duffy hired seven undercover investigators. Their job was to make drug buys and work their ways up the ladder to drug suppliers. But the connections began to lead almost immediately to public officials who were either protecting the drug trade or actively involved in drug trade themselves. And get this, one week before the boys died, a man wearing military fatigues was spotted not far from the train tracks. When police officer Danny Allen attempted to stop him, the man opened fire and managed to disappear into the night. On the same night the boys died, a similar looking man dressed in military fatigues was spotted nearby. Now, if there were to be a drug drop in this designated area, somebody from this ground team, quote unquote, would need to, you know, secure the area and make sure that it was still a good place to drop the drugs, I'm assuming. Now, Barry Seal died 1986, February 19th to be exact, and the boys died 1987 in August. It's not a stretch to say that these operations were still ongoing with other parties continuing the practices and the boy stumbled across the newfound operation. With Barry Seal no longer transporting the goods, they would need somebody else to carry out these operations, correct? After taking him out, they had to figure out the logistics of how they were going to continue the operation. Now, Barry had six kids himself and never had any charges for murder, so I'm assuming if he was still involved in the operation, this may not have even happened. When Barry started working for the DAA, he was assigned to DAA agent Ernst Jacobson to debrief Seal and evaluate his potential as an informant. Jacobson was impressed with Seal's connections, especially the ones with the Koa family. And on March 28th, Seal signed a letter agreeing to serve as a DEA informant. As you can see, Seal was no stranger to working with the government. Seal's second major undercover operation for the DEA involved a long, complicated cocaine shipment from Bolivia, refueling in Colombia, refueling again in Texas, and then delivering cocaine in Las Vegas. And 
Barry Seal working with the government, the DEA, in Mena, Arkansas, where Bill Clinton was the governor at the time, and also allegedly meeting with Barry Seal, it's not a stretch to say that Bill Clinton possibly was getting a kickback on all this. You heard what Roger Reeves, Barry Seal's partner, had to say earlier in the video. He you said know, he was so. he was hooked up with the, with the very top, and he even said, "I'm going to have dinner with the governor tonight." That's at that so, time. Me to Arkansas, Mr. Mr. Bill Clinton, undoubtedly. But why was Bill Clinton meeting with Barry Seal, and why did he protect Dr. Malik so heavily? He had no reason to, unless, of course. He was helping him possibly cover up deaths, being the medical examiner. Maybe it goes even deeper than that. The editor, director, and producer of this video are not suicidal. 